The Driftless Area is an ecological island amidst prairie rolling past horizon. Forested, serpentine river valleys that escaped the planing advancement of the Pleistocene's glaciation. Located in the upper central Midwest, Portions of Illinois, Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin make up the Driftless, an area 15,360,000 acres. Swelling up from the Solarian, aquifers feed, keep alive these ancient waterways, geothermal regulated waters that flow as tributaries to courses dilating the Mississippi River. 181 streams in Minnesota alone. In these deep ravines, genetic secrets are harbored, those as enigmatic as the buried under the effigy mounds, and as resilient as the tombstone cave's paleo-Indian pictographs. Brown Trout all browns in the United States originated either from Germany or Scotland. How did they end up in the interior of North America? Every collection of fauna has passed through a series of ecological filters, producing presently observed assemblages. The first of these filters are the events of the Pleistocene. Despite never being covered, this region took drainage from the advancing and retreating ice sheets. Zoogeographic barriers, such as waterfalls, further separates populations. Physiological limits are better illustrated by an example. Codfish cannot inhabit water colder than 35.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Predation and competition govern most biological interactions. Natural disturbances, such as floods, can alter a stream's species composition, fluctuating which species dominate its habitat as its conditions vary. Shoreline development and associated pollution by way of runoff are the most contemporary examples of the final filter. In 1650, an estimated 38,000 people had migratory access to the undeveloped area of the Driftless, relying upon, were a part of its nature. Not until after the fort building era, from the late 1700s to the mid 1800s, did modern development exact a dramatic transformation upon the landscape. Logging cleared the land for large scale agriculture. Wild forests reduced into rolling fields and how it took less than a century before the vistas were stripped bald as far as the eye can see. By the early 1900s, the degradation so absolute that even the waters no longer supported complete native food chains. The extirpation of their brook trout was obvious. Botanical scientist Michael D. Lee, an expert on Minnesota's bluff country, estimates that pretty much everything that wasn't too steep or too wet to plow was, was turned into cropland. Data on the natural vegetation of Minnesota, collected from 1847 to 1907, tells us that Minnesota's portion of the Driftless was mostly comprised of floodplain and maple basswood forest and oak woodland in brushland. Homing in on Winona County, Minnesota County Biological Surveys identified natural communities. All the areas colored in serves as a good proxy for what is the area's remaining native, natural communities. 
Introduction of non-native trout like browns were the first attempts at reviving the past. Strains of brook trout soon followed. Brown trout were the first to take to wild reproduction. Genetic strains of brook trout from the eastern United States, like their brown counterparts, soon also began naturally reproducing new genetic variations from the seemingly endless genetic varieties tossed into these interconnected waters for over a century. Stocking efforts still serve the 21 million people residing throughout the Driftless area today. Compare a brown's dark spots over light-colored body to this brook trout's pale blue haloed yellow and red spots over blackish olive skin. Phylogenetically, brook trout are classified as being a part of a specific subgroup of salmonids known as char, species of the genus Salvelinus. Distinguished from those of the genus Salmo, not just by color pattern, but also from their adaptation to colder water, optimal temperature range for brook char is 50 to 57.2 degrees Fahrenheit, compared to Brown's preference for 57.2 to 64.4 degrees. How might these two distant cousins have gotten along in this peculiar Midwestern Petri dish? Early and much research demonstrated intraspecific competition for various positions in habitat amongst stream salmonids. This aggressive defense of territory among members of the same species, as Kalleberg in 1958 proposed, evolved as a mechanism for these fishes to make more efficient use of their food supply. In 1966, Chapman argued that competition for space had been substituted for food, and that their territory size is linked to food supply, regulating population density. Tested in 1974 by Slaney and Northcote, they found that both stream salmonid aggression and territory size increased as the amount of food diminished. Since space is linked to food, stream salmonids compete for not just certain habitat, but advantageous positions within it. Notice the social hierarchy, how the larger fish will show up and take position ahead of smaller fishes, or physically relocate one to commandeer the resource. Both species evolved in similar environmental conditions with similar pressures, which explains their tendency to exhibit similar behavior. When like species cohabit, the competitively subordinate animal shifts its use upon resources, reducing niche overlap. Michigan's Department of Natural Resources tested these hypotheses and observations in 1977. July 21st to the 23rd and August 11th, in a wetsuit with goggles and snorkel, the lead scientist went swimming in the east branch of the Us Sable River. Observed and recorded were the resting and feeding positions of populations of fishes where both brook char and browns coexisted. Brown trout were removed afterwards by electrofishing, allowing for conditions to renormalize. Observations were repeated August 20th to the 23rd. Important in-stream cover for char and trout includes woody debris, see how this fish hides underneath, and this one anxiously peering up through a skylight window. Under rocks, how tight and still they'll cling. In 
and how sensitive these fish are, how they react to the shadow of a supposed angler, exceptional vision along with chemoception, hearing, thermoception, and the lateral line's perception of movement, vibration, and pressure gradients in surrounding water excites behavior. Char and trout are easily aroused by anything that suddenly doesn't fit with their natural and habituated surroundings. The anatomy of a string. Runs are deep, fast water with little turbulence. Riffles are shallow, fast, turbulent water. And pools are deep areas with slow moving water. Large fish squeeze underneath the thick root wads of undercut banks. Char and trout take to these resting areas during the day, during the absence of any sufficient invertebrate drift. They prefer pools exceeding three feet with overhead bank cover. Minnesota's DNR in 1989 found that three pools with artificial overhead cover that comprised 23% of an area produced 47% of fish taken in survey. The Michigan DNR's 1977 study witnessed char take more advantageous resting positions once the trout were out of the way. The positions the char took weren't just those previously held by trout, but those that offered the greater water velocity difference, positions closer to swift currents. However, feeding positions of char were similar before and after the removal of trout, suggesting no competition between the two species for this resource. Resting positions near swifter currents allows fish to view organisms as they drift nearby. And to move quickly in response to consume. Brown trout are rover predators. This prowling behavior in lake resident browns that constantly are on the move, searching for prey, Stream trout repurpose their physicality by lying in wait, ready to overwhelm in pursuit. These browns were disturbed by a cameraman.
How easily could such speed be repurposed for a nutritional opportunity? And in the blink of an eye, some small fry gobbled. This Michigan study was conducted on a stream that did not have trout cover. Such areas of wide and shallow streams are characteristic of erosion damage caused by deforestation. More than two million is spent annually from federal and state sources, such as the National Fish Habitat Partnership and Minnesota Outdoor Heritage Fund on Minnesotan wild fish habitat. These boulders, for example, were placed here for rehabilitation. How vegetation grows atop. And just upstream from the bridge. Some more riprap. And so much so, it makes up the entire north side of this pool. Movement between different habitat patches and streams is necessary for both char and trout to complete their life cycles. These stream habitats are categorized as spawning habitat, habitat for rearing, habitat for adults, and overwintering habitat. Gambian revetments protect against erosion. Not only fish benefit from stream rehabilitation. Effective habitat rehabilitation design increases transport of stream bed sediment at normal flow, which allows for pools to deepen, undercut banks to form, and riffles to emerge. Shallow, muddy bottoms result from excess sediment from bank erosion. Gravel is used for nest building by both char and trout. This type of microhabitat is essential for spawning and rearing. Particular agricultural practices in the driftless still intensifies flooding and erosion. Excess sediments fill pools and transitional spaces in riffles at the pool riffle level. Habitat that fish use, such as deep water in pools, are lost at the microhabitat level. How stream rehabilitation projects and management can take an ecosystem from something tamed to something wildish. From 2005 to 2010, 174 Minnesotan streams were sampled by the DNR. Small pieces of brook char fin were clipped and later their DNA analyzed. It wasn't until the 1980s that the genetic origin of stock char was tracked. Persistence of native brook char genes, regardless of the exogenous stocking efforts, have been recorded in Ontario and Maryland. Stocked since 1995, a strain of char known as Minnesota Wild was derived from crossing genetics of a population in Spring Brook and another in Coolidge Creek that were genetically different from those on record. A 2011 demographic study of six interconnected streams in southeastern Minnesota found that emigration rates mostly never exceeded more than 10% per season. Since immigration contributes to each population, Populating each portion of these streams, far reaches serve as potential genetic reservoirs in the event of any future extirpation, which is how it is possible some native, aboriginal brookshire genes could have been passed down through the last century and a half. The distribution of the three various genetic strains of brook char throughout Minnesota's portion of the Driftless.
Aside from the DNR's confirmations of the region's considerable genetic diversity, the Minnesota wild genome also has established wild reproducing populations. The cumulative effects of land conservation practices, improved fisheries management strategies, and the unique landscape of the Driftless, the naturally temperature stable groundwater, and the recently increased base flows, a refugium for brook char is again supporting an increasing biomass. During the 1970s, only 3% of streams in Minnesota's portion of the Driftless harbored brook char. By the mid 1990s, 54%. By 2015, 68% of these same streams support wild reproducing char. Habitat health underpins this return of native species. Char and trout biomass in a Minnesota stream increased from 58.8 pounds per hectare before rehabilitation to 253.31 pounds per hectare after, increasing the probability of something rarer than the odd trophy. Tiger trout are sterile hybrids between a brown trout, Selmotruta, and brook char, Salvelinus fontinalis. Streams with higher abundance of brook char is where tigers tend to appear. All tigers of the Driftless are wild aberrations. Rainbow trout of the genus Uncoruncus, the same as Pacific Coast salmon, are still selectively stocked. Only brook char and brown trout successfully reproduce in the Driftless wild. Brook char emerged sometime between 2.6 million to 11,700 years ago. Their anadromous cousins, like rainbows, evolved four to six million years ago. Likely developing to take advantage of the Pleistocene's glacial melt, how migratory behavior could have been adapted. Tempered streams have experienced the most manipulation of aquatic habitats, channelized, dammed, diverted, and polluted, altering and in some cases eliminating habitat. Even with all these human changes in amount and quality of water flow, few extinctions of tempered stream fish species have occurred even if fauna depletions are common. These fishes have adapted to environments that fluctuate daily, seasonally, annually, and broader. Despite resurrection of potentially native brook char populations, the naturalness of change and presence of randomness yields uncertainty. Brown trout populations have too been increasing and expanding the past 40 years. Browns live longer, grow larger, and become more fecund than brook char. The Driftless gill lice endemic further favors browns. Gill lice are an ectoparasitic copiopod that infect char exclusively. These parasites attach to and damage the gills of their hosts, impairing oxygen exchange. Resistant to chemical treatments, controlling infestations in streams, so far, is left to curiosity.